Hello everybody, this is Conservative Knight here, and this is going to be a recap of the Democratic debate. I didn't watch the thing live, as you can see here, I've been watching YouTube recastings of it. And I've got a bunch of notes here about the debate, not these, these, that we will be discussing. Now, my general impression of the debate before I get into the meat and potatoes of it is just, it's just a campaign for more free stuff, more fantasy land, fairy tale economics that don't work, have proven never to work at all. And just being flat misinformed, being too soft on terrorism, um, and just, it's depressing. And let me tell you who won this debate before we go on. I don't have a lot of notes on him because at the end of the day, he's not going to be relevant. But Martin O'Malley won this debate. It wasn't even close. And here's the reason why I say O'Malley won the debate, is that while Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders were grandstanding each other, um, Martin O'Malley talked about his record, and I think that's an important thing, because this is the only one with actual experience, and it does matter minimize this. It matters a lot because Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton don't have a lot of room to run on their records. Bernie Sanders passed one VA bill. What he won't ever tell you is that that's the only bill he ever got passed other than renaming two post offices in Vermont, which is meaningless. And that, that's a shining achievement, and yet, you know, that, that's what he listed as his um, tragedy while in office. I'm sorry, but putting pen to paper isn't being on the ground. And, and I will say, O'Malley, I have deep disagreements with him. Most of his positions are extremely far left for how we've known the left. But... In terms of rational candidates, I think that Mart Martin O'Malley is the least insane of the Democrats. The most realistic, the least, the least in terms of wanting to tell fairy tales and and sob stories. And he talked a lot about his record, and I like that. I don't know how accurate it is that'll be for others to fact check and I might even look that up myself and but it's not going to matter because he's not going to win but I just wanted to point out that Martin O'Malley was the most rational and that is why I think he won the debate now let's go to my debate notes here because you know hell if I can remember everything you know let's see none of the Democrats would acknowledge the term Muslim Islamic radicals I think that's important because, for two reasons. Um, number one, it's not just jihadists that are attacking us. Because not everyone is a part of a jihad that is a Muslim. Some Muslims just attack because um, they're jealous or whatever. A jihad is a specific declaration of war from Muslims. It is to say... You are bad. We are going to destroy you. ISIS has declared a jihad. The random Muslim that goes into a place and suicide bombs a mall in Israel is not a jihadist. It is a Muslim radical. So let's stop being soft. Acceptance of Syrian refugees, of course, all of them, you know, let them in, let them in, let them in. And, you know, screening, how, it's like, they're all talking about screening of these Syrian refugees. And here's two big problems I have with it. Number one, there are a 
oppressed people all around this world. In Sudan, in Congo, you know, you can name three-fourths of the African countries. You have North Korea, you have Myanmar. There are a lot of poor people who are extremely oppressed on this planet. So, why are we playing favorites with Syria? That is something I do not understand. And number two, you, you say you're going to screen them? How are you going to screen somebody from ISIS who is going to obviously um, appear to be normal? I mean, what are they going to say? Oh, I'm a member of ISIS. You know, you think they're all going to have records? These aren't professional terrorists. Have you seen the technology that ISIS uses and why it is so hard to put a dent in them? They're using ragtag technologies in order to do these things and the weapons and stuff that we gave them. But their technology is very, very basic. They don't mind being rugged. And these people, they're recruiting people, folks. It's not its not just a case of, you know, professional secret agent terrorists. No. These are young kids that are being recruited through social media and going to these ISIS training camps. And then, okay, they're going to come back and they're going to act like a refugee. Just like with France. Just like anywhere. You know, God bless the people of France. It's, you know, on one hand, it's like the Europeans have really done a lot of this to themselves because they didn't follow our leadership example of understanding that this is not a good thing. And us caving in, that is not a good thing. They should know better. And it's just a crying shame that this had to happen. And... They allowed it. You know, you don't need to play the blame game because, I mean, we have to forgive for mistakes. You know, and I'm sure a lot of the French people, they understand that now, when it's at their doorstep, it's just, you can't just take people like this. You don't know who they are. And you have no way of knowing their intent. You can't read their minds. You can't. You know, it, it, all it takes is just for them to have some kind of underground source. You know, they don't have to bring the bombs there. They can make them in that country. They just do them in secret. You can't do these kind of things. You know, but... Anyhow, that's enough of that, but it's just, their position's just radical, it, it's nonsense, and it's just, it's vote fishing is what it is. They're trying to get minority votes, trying to get Muslim Americans, they're trying to um, lock down another demographic. Anyhow, moving on. Now, of course, free college, they all support that in various forms. Bernie Sanders supports full paid tuition, Hillary and O'Malley are a little bit less on that and this is just part of the um, economic fantasy land that these people live in it's you know, you're gonna you think you're gonna get more income by raising taxes on Wall Street speculation you know in a market that's already you know on eggshells you know even with quantitative easing investors are sh still unsure that their money is real and now you're going to sit there and we're going to raise taxes what do you think that's going to do the federal reserve will not even raise interest a half a percent they might be doing it this december i don't know i haven't kept up on that specifically i think they're raising it a little bit but it's like, you know, they're walking on eggshells with this, and then you're going to sit there and 
say, oh, we're going to tax Wall Street. It's fantasy land. You're not going to generate income doing that. You're just going to put us more in the debt. You can't do that. Look at the tax history of the United States. When taxes have been lowered, tax income has gone up. When Obama raised taxes, tax income did not go up. When those Bush tax cuts were put into place, we gained no benefit from it. We're, we're still receiving 2007 levels of taxation. It's, it's fantasy land. You can't just... The economy is like a fluid. It is not... You can't throw something on it and stick. You can't just pull a lever and have predictable results. That's not the way the economy works. It, w it works as a flow. It works as a flow from commodity to commodity. And if you're not convinced, then think of it this way. Let's just say you're buying bread at Walmart for $2 a loaf. And then Walmart says, $2 is too cheap. You're going to pay your fair share. And then they raise it to $10. Is Walmart going to make five times more money on that loaf of bread? Of course not, because what are you going to do? It's going to change how much bread people buy. And so what will happen is Walmart's going to lose money on the bread. Although it's five times more expensive, less than one-fifth of people are going to buy that particular kind of bread. Why? Because they have other flavors of bread to choose from, other brands. You know, the, the economic Looney Tunes has to stop. And then I think the big failure of the debate, and, and this, is, this, this happened more than once, other times to a lesser extent, I think I have a couple more here, is the moderators cited the 67% increase in health care costs since 2011 when Obamacare was implemented. Neither one of them even addressed that figure. Neither one. Not, neither Hillary nor Bernie, and I don't even know if O'Malley had anything to say about it, but he probably didn't either. But, you know, and, and not only that, but they say progress. It's progress. How is people paying more for health care progress? I don't get it. And then Bernie Sanders is talking about Medicare for All, and it's like, um, these people haven't looked at the, the numbers. The numbers for both education and health care, and just let me bring that up. Hang on, let me put up this link. I forgot to put up this link. Let's see. Okay, because this is the Institute of... Okay, here we go. I think this is it. Yeah, it's right here. See, this is... Um, going back to education real quick, because I forgot to show this. This is what our government spends on education. For primary... For primary secondary, which is elementary and high school, we rank number four. Switzerland, Norway, and Austria are the only three that are above us in primary, secondary education funding. But look where we are in college funding. They talk about free college. Look at where we are. We are miles above second place, which is, um, I believe that's, shoot, what is this country? <laughs> they didn't even label it, did they? There's Denmark, Sweden, Switzerland, U.S., and then there's another here. I'm not sure what, but we're number one, and we're also number one in total in health care. And here's the numbers on health care. I can't sort this chart, so you have to take my word for it that here's, here's where we are in health care. The very last one, we spend... Let's see, what is this? This is per capita. 
I'm not sure if this is millions, um, but if you look at the numbers, we're ranked number two. 4.160. The only one ranked above us is, if I can find it up here, is Norway. We're ranked number two, and this is this is public funding, by the way. This isn't including private, because private we're through the roof. Public, we're second place. So although we're not the top funder in public health care, we're pretty damn close. So it's like, are you really? I keep opening this wrong one. So you really think we're going to lower health care costs through more and more government funding? We're already doing that. It's not working. But the basic thing is neither one of them, nobody addressed it because to them it's, it's not about costs really. The costs are just an excuse. It's a systemic desire to control lives. And of course, Sanders citing that we're the only country that doesn't guarantee health care. That's idiotic. We have emergency care. We have Medicaid if you're poor. And so we do guarantee some form of health care to all citizens. And again, we're number two in healthcare spending per capita. Let's see, I already addressed that. More per capita. Pathway to. Yeah. All three of them support a pathway to citizenship for illegals. Now, let me just kind of explain my position just so you don't get me confused. I believe that we do need to make immigration easier. I think we can use some immigrants. I think we could use more than what we're letting in. And I think we should do things to um, limit the waiting lists. But here's the thing. We have illegals coming in here and they're making the lucky ones can fake their identity, find a lazy contractor, get a good paying but very, very hard working and demanding job in, say, construction. There's a lot of Hispanics at work in construction, a lot of Mexicans, and they are very hard workers. I love, I, I love their work ethic. If you look at Mexico, they have by far the highest average hours worked per week. It's not even close. It They put Japan to shame. And you think Japan is bad? Look at Mexico. Mexican, they are so hard of workers. And they are generally amazing people. But here's the big problem. Here's, here's a couple problems that we're facing with um, illegal aliens. They're taking jobs that other people cannot get. And note that I say cannot, because it's not a matter of white people won't work these jobs because they're too lazy. That, that's a stupid oversimplification of the thing. Because see, what happens is um, illegals, they understand where to go to get jobs on farmland that pay next to nothing. Perhaps two dollars an hour under the table. Money that cannot be traced. Money that, if you or I tried to work for that, somebody's going to be thrown in jail for doing it. Thrown in jail or shut down. One of the two. Neither one's good. They work for pitiful wages. So, if you're supporting illegal immigration, you are supporting slave labor. We're supposed to be the country that doesn't have the sweatshops. 
we're supposed to be the country where people make a decent living. You can't have that if you support if you support a system that allows for this to go on and makes it easy for it to go on. Makes it easy for contractors to be lazy and not check for proof of citizenship and such things like that. And number two is because these people are unaccounted for they end up in our cities enjoying people who can't account for them and that is the gangs and it's the dirty little word that Democrats do not want to talk about never the gangs because it is the gangs where the most violence happens and where are the gangs located you guessed it, in cities run by liberals. So you have all this gang violence, and you have a lot of illegals part of it, and that causes a huge amount of the firearm deaths, which we'll talk about here in a minute. And it's just, you can't... I agree with what Trump said. I, I don't think, first of all, that you can deport 11 million people. It's not the statement that I agree with. And I don't even think he thinks it's possible. It's the attitude that we have to have, though. We have to have the attitude that if you are here illegally, and you had children here while you were here illegally, you and your children are gone. You are going back where you came from because it is not legal for you to be here. Period. We've got to start respecting the rule of law and be fair to the people trying to come in legally, to the people looking for jobs here and not accept a regime where some people are allowed to outcompete the residents just because they can work under the table and they know how to they know the avenues to go through to get this kind of work because this under the table work by the way it's not going to be listed often in Craigslist and it's not going to be listed in a newspaper. It's not going to be... They're not going to have hiring signs. You have to go through contacts to get the, this kind of work. You have to know people who know people, and they will set you up with somebody. That, that's how they get these kind of jobs. And so, when you hear stories about they kick illegals out and nobody's taking the jobs, it's because they can't take the jobs. It's not because they don't want the jobs, believe me. You know, working on a farm, it's hard work, but it it beats being broke. It beats having no money. People would love that kind of work. We have a low participation rate for a reason. So, bottom line is, of course, they're insane on immigration. They, they want they, they basically don't even want a border at this point. And this all comes down to the vote. These people understand what's going on. And it's all about securing votes, making it easier for people to vote who have no business voting. People who are not citizens of this nation. Who are not allowed to vote. You know, members of ISIS are not allowed to vote. Members of the European Union are not allowed to vote in our elections. And Mexicans, who are not American citizens, do not have the right to vote. That's just the way it is. And then you get discussion of minimum wage, all of them want fifteen, fifteen, twelve dollars an hour. Now, to explain my 
position on that. I do. I do agree that we have to raise the minimum wage. It's not an option at this point. We just have to do it. Seven twenty-five an hour does not cut it that much anymore. It's got to be a little bit higher than that. Not significantly. I think around this time, probably eight seventy-five to nine dollars an hour would be a sufficient minimum wage. And but in the broader sense, we have to be doing things to stop this debate from happening in the first place. I don't agree with a federal minimum at all because the federal minimum just doesn't make sense, at least in a quantitative fashion. Because each area of the country has their own cost of living, they have their own individual living situations. Somebody living in New York City needs different things than somebody living in in Wyoming in a rural county with um, 23 people living in it or you're on a small farm or you're working on a small farm people have different needs in different areas and these costs are drastically different in some areas 725 will be enough but not many anymore that's why I think it should go up we need the minimum wage to be up where at least a small town person can um, work 40 hours a week and you know, be fine with their typical living expenses but we need to have this at the state level like you know Iowa maybe will be about the average. California will probably be way, way higher. They may need $10 an hour or more. They may need more. In New York, the same thing. They, they may need significantly more. But a federal minimum wage just doesn't make sense in the long term. And Bernie Sanders is talking about, they were talking about what's called, what's been coined as demand-side economics, where people have money to spend. The problem is the data doesn't show this. Is Yes, it is true that if people have more disposable income, they are going to buy more stuff, and that is going to feed into the business. They are absolutely right. The problem is minimum wage does not do this and has never once look at the data on this fact check me Mr. O'Malley that minimum wage hikes have not once been shown to increase the disposable income of people it has never once been shown to have much of any impact on the economy if anything you have a slight correlation of stunted job growth following every minimum wage increase and see what happens is hours get lowered and while you may not lose your job your hours are going to get cut and they're not going to hire as many people and if the, the company doesn't hire as many people guess what the disposable income in totality does not rise it's only going to affect you if you keep your job and keep your hours. It'll certainly help some people. Some people won't make a difference, and for those who are not employed, it makes the biggest difference because they can't find work even more so. Let's see, and breaking up the big banks, this is the big where they were all trying to showboat. Clinton made the retarded assertion about 9-11 for her um, as an explanation for her donations whether or not that whether or not the donations impact her is meaningless to the fact that the 
the fact that 9-11 was not the reason they're donating to her. Let me just say that much. I, I think, yes, donations do matter. But for me, it's more about results. Where you get your money for your marketing isn't important to me. What's important to me is your job performance. You know, do things improve on your watch? Yes or no? That is my big concern. The donations are just a small part. But as far as the specific thing about breaking up the banks... I'm actually going to pull a Democrat on this one. I think that if, and only if, we can ensure that the same things don't happen that made the banks big in the first place, I absolutely agree that we could break up the big banks, and there's also a few other things we can break up. I believe in it because in my lifetime I've seen it. And it did work when we did it with AT&T. It was probably the government's biggest success story, probably in history, because if you look at what it led to, it led to AT&T itself being a more innovative company than it otherwise would have. It led to the, it led to the phone wars of the 90s. You had explosive competition between the breakup entities and then you had other entities enter the market you had cell phones you had rapid advancement of things and it was good so yes I have seen this work and yes it did work but the thing that made it work was that they broke up and the government didn't do a lot to fiddle with it, and not to mention they went more toward wireless and cell phone technology, building cell towers, which is probably one of the least regulated things by the government, and lo and behold, it worked. Something that is largely absent of regulation, it worked. So, you can do things like that but and, and this is what Dr. Carson brought up in the debate and was one of his shining moments was that you have to focus on doing the things that prevent the big banks from being or that allow the big banks from being to be big in the first place and that is government regulations that favor the big banks over the community banks. And while Sanders talks about it, what he doesn't do is he does not understand basic economics. Because his idea is reinstall Glass-Steagall and put in more regular, you know, and these aren't going to you know, putting in these regulations is not going to stop the big banks from getting big again. Because it didn't stop them when we had those. We had, we had big banks when we had Glass-Steagall. They were dramatically increasing in size well before that. Even during Reagan's time. It didn't take Glass-Steagall to limit them. B believe me, that didn't do much of anything. You need regulations that don't crush the smaller competitors. And see, this is where the enigma is, is that any regulation, either direct or indirect, on an industry, is going to disproportionately affect the smallest denominator, which cannot pass the expenses down. It's true for businesses, and it's true for individuals. The lowest of the low will always pay for everything. It 
gets passed down. That is what happens in society. Every tax, every regulation, it's not the big guy who pays it. Because the big guy, they can move, they have freedom to move their money. If something is becoming too expensive, they move their money either to another country or to another industry. Whatever is going to be best for them. And you cannot stop that. That is basic economics, and Bernie Sanders does not understand it well enough to do the things that he's talking about doing. And Bernie Sanders, he talked about, you know, the moderator asked him, well, how are you going to appeal to these people who are winning, who who are voting for Republicans in local elections? How are you going to unite the party? And... He just repeats left-wing insane talking points about, you know, let's offer free stuff to this group, that group, free college tuition, all that, when that is the thing they're voting against. That's the thing people are tired of hearing. These empty promises and fairy tales that just are not great things. They're fairy tales. You know, I think I called it like a wonderland at the beginning of this video, and that's what it is. Is that, That's not what people want to hear. That's not what people like me, who vote for these kinds of people, want to hear. What I want to hear is, how are you going to compromise? You know, what can we reconcile from a left-wing candidate? Where can we come together? And you talk about people being in agreement. Well, just look at the last couple of years of elections and you'll see what the people really think. What the people really think. Because hearing about it from the Huffington Post who is going to ask questions in a specific way in order to get specific responses is very different than when people go to those polls and they click on a name on a computer screen. Because warping their positions is not going to make them vote differently. What else do we have here? Bernie Sanders does not... Yeah, about the emails... Uh, really we know Clinton's a criminal that's just a fact so that's not important but Bernie Sanders didn't address the contradiction and said he just repeated I'm tired of hearing about the emails you know tired of hearing about the emails that's, that's what they both kept repeating completely deflecting any kind of questioning whatsoever about the emails, and they are a big concern. Or they're a moderate concern. They're not a big concern. But she is under FBI investigation. Let's remember that. This isn't just tabloid journalism creeping its way into CBS. This is an actual FBI investigation. And for me personally, I think she deserves jail time over Benghazi. And the only thing that may save her from it is the fact that she was so incompetent over being a Secretary of State that she had to resign because she lacked the knowledge to prevent those attacks from happening. And I don't even need to go in further. So, they talk about race, and I guess we could close on this. Um, it was strange in a democratic debate to hear how the two leading candidates focused so little on race. I expected to hear a lot about this from them, but, and I have a possible explanation for this too, but let, let me just, before I go into the speculation of why Bernie and Hillary didn't respond to it, let me just go to O'Malley's answer. 
and I don't think he quite hit it, but he came so close. Because the biggest concern about the black about blacks is that there is there's a disparity but it's a more complicated issue it's not just rah rah racist against blacks that's not what it is it's about socioeconomic issues urban violence he elaborated on urban violence and that's where he almost got it. And maybe he gets it more than what he's letting on. He, he obviously didn't have time to go into too much more detail. But the gang violence is the problem. It's the problem with the incarceration rate. It's the problem with the drug use disparity. It's the problem with the welfare disparity. All of it comes down to urban squeller and gangs. And O'Malley almost got it there. But the reality is neither one of the other two even wanted to talk about it. And the big reason is it's talking about race amongst themselves does not benefit them. And again, I'm going to drop this hammer just like I've dropped it in every other video I've made about race. And if you're black, I hope you're listening to this. I hope you made it this far. They don't care about you. And when I say that, I mean it. They do not care about you. You are a tool to win elections. That is it. That is the straight talk, 100% God's honest truth. They don't care. And just because they mention you or the racial plight or anything that they mention, it does not mean they care because at the end of the day, what are they doing for you? What have they ever done for you? I'm from just south of Detroit, major black area. What have they done for you? I, I've ridden past these neighborhoods, half-abandoned houses, boarded up, fenced-in yards, overgrown lawns. I've seen it. The, the gang violence. People just wandering around aimlessly in rags. It's... It's not a pretty sight. And I'm not proud to be from that. But that is where I come from. They don't care about you. All they want is for you to go to that poll and for you to vote or for you to have that optimism about change. Maybe things will be better. They're not. I'm I'm just being real with you guys. It's not coming. If you don't believe me, I can show you, in fact, I already have in a previous video I did on Detroit. If you want to look at my position, you're welcome to look at my other videos, particularly the one on Detroit. Every mayor of Detroit has been a Democrat since 1962. Detroit's suburbs such as Auburn Hills and and all them I can't think of a lot of them but it's just they're all doing great. The Detroit suburbs are some of the most beautiful places in the country. If you look at the ratings for the various cities and communities around that area, they actually have scores for those areas. Look at the scores. 
some of the top places to live in this country are right around the decaying corpse of Detroit. And these are white communities. What have they done for you? And I'm not saying that you should vote for Republicans. You need to have a mind of your own because you know what? You have a mind. You, you know, and I'm not saying this in a condescending way because it's people think that you can't be an individual, that you can't stand up for yourself. That you have to be a part of a fraternity, a group of a group of people that are just gonna watch your back, and you can be a part of that, but you don't need it. You are just as important, just as loved, just as smart, just as capable as anyone else. The only thing that is different is the pigment of skin. That is it. You don't need people to treat you like you're inferior, like, you know, you need help with this, you need help with that. And yes, sometimes, you know, we all need help with things, but not because of our skin color. Because of socioeconomic factors, we may need a little bit of help because of various other things, having children, needing to take care of infants. You know, those are the reasons you need help. You don't need an affirmative action based community. There's, there's other ways to get help and that's just demeaning to you. That is saying that you can't do X because you're black. And, and I'm just saying, please, do not fall into that. And I'm just going to end it right there. Because it's a very sensitive topic for me. I've had a lot of black friends, and it's just... It brings me to tears that we're in such a state that we're in regarding race. Because most of my black uh, best friends have been black. And so that's where it hits home with me. Anyhow, just... O'Malley's the most rational Democrat, and I urge you guys... To give him a stronger look and more of your support. Because while he may not be a, val a very good president in my eyes because he is too far left, I don't think that we would be in any worse shape than we are under Obama in the very least. And at the very most, he may bring a small increment of improvement from what we've had under Obama and Bush. Thanks for listening. God bless. <laughs>